Hallo Freunde, uh, ich hoffe, dass uh, alles ist gut für euch. Uh, er ist uh, 10 Uhr in Redmond, Washington und es ist Uhr für .NET API Review. Uh, as you can see, we have a big screen of red and I made a grammatical error because Emo uh, laughed. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, as usual for this part in the release, we're going to uh, jump right in and see how much progress we can make today. So, add a setter to transaction manager default timeout and max timeout 59282. Uh, Hong? Yeah, hi. So this one was filed by the VS installer team um, actually a year ago. We didn't treat this a high priority, but recently we also have a customer request for the um, default timeout property as well. So basically mm -hmm. these worked in .NET framework. Um, they can set this in the um, um, machine.config, um, but then when customer move to .NET Core, there's no way they can set it. There's no configuration for um, the, the, the .NET Core, and then the they cannot set it in the code. So for this .NET 7 release, we just want to add an API, add a setter for both of these properties. That's the proposal. So what's the impact of those? So the default timeout presumably is the timeout that is used when you create new transactions and don't specify a timeout? Yeah. Right now there's a, I, I think the default timeout is like one minute. The customer cannot change it. The maximum default time, the timeout, the default value is 10 minutes, something like that. But the customer who, who want to customize, they cannot do this at all. And so why can't they specify timeouts? For me? So why cannot, the, so basically, my, do I understand it is like the default timeout is used when you create new transactions and you don't specify a custom timeout. So what prevents the customer from specifying a custom timeout for their transactions? Because there's no setter. On the individual mm -hmm. transaction. Yeah, on the, I mean, I, I assume the default, like the word default implies to me that if you don't specify one on a transaction, then we use this static value, right? And so I, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is like, what prevents the customer from when they create transactions to say, I want this timeout that is like for four hours, for example, like why would they want to change the default for everybody? Why would they want to? Um... So the reason I'm asking is because very often what we found is that like there are some things that are kind of like rude to set when you're a library developer, right? Because you don't control the app. This is one of those examples where if you set it as a library, that would be pretty rude because you now you change the setting for everybody, right? Um, it might still make sense for apps to change those values, but most of the time our defaults are not actually settable. They're just, you know, defaults when you don't specify something. The, the, the expectation is you do specify one if you care about something else. So, I mean, we can make it settable, but like I would say if, if there is a concern that, you know, you, you things can't be localized, that, that, that might be a different issue. I don't think that applies here, um, but the, these are settable before on that night framework. It's just not through the API. And right now, the workaround we have provided for the customer is to use the reflection. And we think that's not the best use. So that's Oh, why. I missed that part. Oh, I see. I see. So not in framework, they could set it. And so now in core, it's a regression because we no longer have machine configuration. Yeah. Yeah. I see. But it could be set if we wanted to try and make sure that effectively only the app developer could do it. Um, instead of having a public setter, we could read it from app config, and then the the application would have to register a line in app config at startup, and then the first time this ever gets queried, it would use whatever value was there and then never read it again. If we're we concerned about, about having a settable setter, we static. thought about that, and Nida and I discussed this last yesterday uh, on Teams. We thought about it, 
and then we think we just want to provide the API to see whether customer like that or not. If customer complain, we will think about next release to see whether we can use the app setting. Oh, yeah. you suggesting the other way? I mean, generally speaking, app config we no longer pull from, right? App config is only for the developer, right? So like somebody would have to read the setting from app config and push well, it into the API. So there needs to be a settable value if you want to do that. I, I think that the .NET host has a magic way of loading some things into app context. But if if nothing else, it's you would just say app context dot set value system dot transactions dot transaction manager dot default timeout, um, and then sure. their default timeout milliseconds, and then you know a whatever number. And but that's still a thing that everybody can do, right? So that wouldn't it would be logically the same as making the settable. No, because right? most of most of the things that we have as settings from app context, at least when we used it in .NET Framework for uh, the settings that we called you know quirks of when we fixed a or when we did a runtime targeting version lock of a behavior, um, we usually read those once into a lazy and then. So in this case, transaction manager, the first time anything ever queried default timeout, it would read app context and it would remember that value forever. And then changing it later d does no good. So the last person to set it before it was read wins. Um, that's probably going to be your app. It could technically be a library that you called into, but it seems unlikely. And it that moves it into a basically you can set this once behavior. The problem with saying you want API and then later you'll let something like app context do it is the APIs once it's there it's there forever and now like you can make it throw but that's kind of weird um, so really this is just the question of are we concerned with adding a static setter we we don't we generally don't like them because they make the process hard to reason about yeah it's basically just shared mutable state right that's generally the, the problem um, I think we discussed on the thread a bit, like, is there any tearing concerns, but it doesn't seem like there are because they're just longs. And even on Where ARM, can apparently. Make it, uh, implement in a thread, thread safe way. So say that again? We're going to implement in a thread safe way. And um, we saw the comments about tearing concern. Yeah, I th I th the way I saw it is like a, we discussed it, but we don't believe there is one. So I think we could make them setters. It's just, you know, it would functionally be okay. It's just, uh, as Jeremy said, it has this kind of like slight smell of like, okay, what happens now when these things change over time within the process, right? Does this cast, does, does this cause problems? Um, and if you believe the answer to that is no, then that's fine too. Um, but I agree with Jeremy that if we want to just more or less replicate the .NET framework behavior, then idiomatically, we wouldn't make them settable. We would basically wire them via uh, probably app context. So Jeremy, the app context stuff, uh, I know that uh, exists in framework. Is it really also available for .NET Core as well? I mean, we definitely have the type app context, which is a string to something dictionary and we've used I'm pretty sure we've used it in a couple places yeah it's in .NET Core since v1 we added app context to .NET Framework 4.6 and uh, that made it into .NET Core v1 as well but Jeremy also mentioned that the setter stuff um, the settings well it could be possible but it hasn't been used for settings right for setter I mean, it. So, you know, we have here something in TLS cache sizing in SSL stream. And so this is. This one looks like it's reading it every time, but there are other places that would read it into a lazy of T uh, so that it only reads it once or, you know, other only read once patterns. And, you know, so you just lock in whatever value you want it to be from you call app context get data and save the answer um, and similarly somebody can call or somebody can call app context set data because it's public and 
Why are we doing try catch all and not just try parse? <laughs> it's a bit weird, but okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't look too closely. The point is the the, <laughs> yes, the, the concept, the, not the quote. The, the point is, <laughs> we do have examples where we do read from app context, um, and so that would just be that you end up document. So if you want to go that route, you would just document on these two properties that. They are settable via app context, and you would say what the name of the string is, which would um, probably be something like system.transactions.transactionmanager.default timeout milliseconds, and then you would have that be an int uh, for the, the default timeout. The reason I say that is because I don't know that if we still have a config loader, I don't know that it no has a format for loading time spans directly into that dictionary. So it would probably be strings that you have to parse out or integers right I mean the the shape is reasonable assuming we're not concerned with the risk of settable statics but just in in general we try to avoid them yeah and because another problem with statics is when you can set them right <laughs> so yeah. the like I mean, yes, as early as possible, but like you're very unlikely to literally write them in main. So yeah, I mean, it's also possible that this, the class with public API could, you know, remember have I has the set been called before and only lets it get called once. Yep. Uh, and throws a invalid operation exception if you try calling set a second time. That effectively is the same as config, just. There's a tempting call, and somebody's allowed to call it. Right. The app hopes it's well, the app. The customer said it in the uh, in the app contexting .NET Core. They would just, you know, in main, you would just write a line. I mean, the way you would set it is like you have various options, I think. So it's not like a some kind of JSON file, like similar to config. I th I think we have one somewhere of like the runtime settings dot JSON. I think might load things in, but honestly, I've never used that feature, so I don't know how it works. Uh, Is it possible this setter might be too late for the cost? I don't know. I mean, the idea is you should basically be setting it in. Yeah, I mean that that's what I that's kind of but logically that's the same problem as the settable property, right? You have to decide when to write it. <clears throat> so practically as early as possible, but it's probably not going to be main. <laughs> yeah. It's probably going something down the road. Uh, yeah. I mean somewhere. So Again, like that's an option. Adding these with remembering that they've been set and throwing is an option. Adding these where they're just settable and dangerous is an option. Uh, anybody other than emo or I want to give an opinion? I guess not. Quiet room today. So what would you like to do, Hong? I want the setter. <laughs> That's why I'm not saying. <laughs> but I can explore the app setting. I can go explore the app context thing. If we feel it's a better suitable one, I might go down that route too. I didn't know about that before this meeting. Emo, can you type a um, sample 
letter app contact center into the chat. A link I should... so I can take a look after the meeting. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. You're saying I should point in, I should add a pointer to app context. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 Yep. I just looked at the documentation myself, so I have, happen to have the link handy. Um, so apparently you have multiple ways you can initialize app context. Uh, you can do it via web config. I assume that also works for app config would be my guess. Um, and of course you can also do it via the registry because uh, we are cool like that. Yeah, and it of course doesn't make sense if you're on Linux. In uh, YouTube chat, uh, Philip Navarra says that the .NET hosts can read the runtime JSON and load the initial app context values as well. I don't know that I've ever seen an example of that, but it did match my belief that we did wire that up somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that comment Emo is typing is fair. Yeah, I don't... Of course, it's not in the, the doc still. <laughs> uh, next time. All right. So anything we want to call this emo? So, I mean, I don't feel super strongly. I would just generally say, like, you know, as you said as well, like, I would avoid static setters if you can help it. Um, I think I would prefer the app context switch. But if you prefer the setter, I'm also okay with that, I guess. So approved I, but discouraged? Sort of, yeah. I mean, it's a legacy API from our point of view, more or less anyway. So I guess my caliber is not as high as it may should have been, but <laughs> it's a, it is what it is, I guess. All right, well, yeah, barring dissent other than the uh, general don't have a static setter. So I'll leave the comment of we're going to hit I, approve, I, but we prefer you don't actually do this yeah and, but, i do appreciate that i think that's fair but if you need it then this is probably the right shape yeah i mean the proposal i think is pretty straightforward it's just whether we want to do it at all right <laughs> but if you do it via an api that would be the api okay thanks um can i ask one more question sure is the, we have that long pr you know, Steven, Steven, you and Jerry, Jeremy, you got looped in as well. Do we need to come to this room? Do we need, do I set up another meeting? Because Steve is going to be on vacation next week and we do want to get that into Donna 7. When you say the PR, the, the PR to add these the APIs? API, the APIs, for the APIs, the API review. Yeah. I think I Jeremy it's... commented that it's even, it's a huge line of code, but it's, you know, you can read it quite very quickly. And uh, so do we need a meeting? That's what I'm trying to say. Do we need to come to this API console board meeting for that? I think the short answer is yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. I guess I won't make it next week because um, Steve is on vacation. All right then, I'll bring that back to the team. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I assume the, the PR that she mentioned was for other APIs, not the ones we just approved, right? Yeah, it's a, a long uh, list of taking some internal APIs and making them public. I see. Yeah. yeah. Then I would agree with that. I think you're on the thread. Just yeah, I be... think I've seen something like that. That was, that was why I was not sure which one she talked about. Um, all right, so then I guess yeah. next one is so, uh, the rate limiter, right? Yep, improve yeah. rate limiter metrics 71804. Brennan, bonjour. Yes. Um, okay, so today we have uh, the get available permits method on rate limiter and the partition rate limiter. Um, and it basically is just like a, a best uh, guess of what the current permit count is in the internal like uh, state of the rate limiter. And the initial design for this, um, if you go back to like a year and a half ago or so, was that it would be used for statistics, basically. Um, I don't 
see how useful it is in like real ex like usage for checking how many permits there are before calling acquire. So I think like the main usage I can see is for statistics. Um, and on that vein, like there's a lot more things that would be useful to see from a statistics point of view, um, which is why we are wanting to try to change this to be more generic or not generic, but more useful um, and show a bunch more statistics. And this is heavily inspired by the memory cache stuff that was done, I think earlier in .NET 7, um, where a bunch of statistics were now um, uh, added. Um, and so that's kind of the core idea. Um, and the usage down below will show like how to wire up metric or meters and stuff to uh, have named um, rate limiters, I guess, uh, in your like .NET counters, um, similar to what was shown for the, the memory cache. So how often do you think this is going to be called? Um, I mean, our, I think our default in .NET counter is like one second thing, so that seems like reasonable. Um, it's also, it could be useful um, from a non-metrics point of view, just to like see the, well, I guess that is metrics. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Um, I would assume one second, but of course you could configure that. But are you thinking from like a perf standpoint of view? Yeah, because it's a class, right? So that means every right. time you call it, you by definition you kind of have to allocate because you can't mutate the ones you yep. already handed out. Yep. So if you do it in a hot loop, that would probably be bad. Yes. I mean, nothing says that the implementation has to allocate one every call. I mean, how else would you do it? I mean, it it could internally have a how often does it feel like updating, and it publishes it, and two calls get the same one until it cuts over, and I mean, things are oh, possible. Okay, sure, sure. Oh, you can, sure. yes, you can, you can, yeah, you can delay the construction. Um, but I think the problem is still that you know you can't mutate the thing. So if multiple parties are reading it, it would be bad if you suddenly change the. <laughs> the pages that are on an instance you already gave out. So you can throttle, I guess, but then you know, if you really want to measure once a second and then the thing only gets updated every five minutes, then you're yeah, defeating the purpose of the of the measurement, I guess. Right. I mean, I would say I like the thing that you basically hand something out where there are properties on because it means these things are consistent, right? They're not independent values that now are out of sync. Um, and I would say it's also in line with what we have done with the GC. Right? With the GC, we started with a struct, and then we ended up doing it with a class anyway. So uh, it's probably fine. Yeah, why was that's That's interesting. Why was it changed from a struct to a class? Because the struct became too big. Ah, yes. <laughs> so the struct is now just wrapping the class, and then <laughs> it's a bit of a ranking design now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an internal class, basically, that the struct is wrapping. So, I mean, I can see the same. I mean, generally speaking, with statistics, you know, once you have them, you want more, right? So. Yep. So you'd add more eventually. Yeah. So I think in the next release, you have like, oh, we want these other six things, and now it's like 12 longs, right? And like, yeah, that's a bit big for a struct. Yeah, well, especially for things like the the sample here of if you end up with a whole bunch of these things of like great, let's let's go take like a four four k chunk of stack because of all the statistics we have to pass back this struct and you read one value out of it. It's like yep. Uh, maybe maybe don't have an infinite struct. So yeah, I think this looks reasonable. Um, um, I know on Tuesday there was some talk about required in it being bad. Is that like true in this case too? So in 
in this case, this is an output object, right? And like you could define this as get only and with private set if you wanted to, but presumably you're letting it be public init just for test purposes of people who want to test passing for longs. The yeah. the problem with required on an input object is right now that really means C sharp understands it's required and nothing else does. So we have a we we don't get the same signaling. Um, if you want to call it required, and you're really the only expected assigner, then that's fine. It's just it gives a hint to somebody who's writing tests that they should set everything, unless yeah, the they're writing it in sharp. The one we discussed last time, the issue with required was the thing that was required was a complex object. Um, and so while required could mandate that the property was assigned to something, it didn't guarantee that it uh, was actually a, filled out appropriately. So the implementations would still need to validate the object that was being stored. In this case, the things are longs. Uh, so there's, uh, unless negative values or something are prohibited, there's nothing to be validated gotcha um so private set would mean that you'd have to um a custom uh, implementers would have to uh create their own in like type uh, inherit from this class basically and return ah right class. you're okay yeah you're not a closed ecosystem um right yes um so yeah that's another thing i i did leave it unsealed um for the custom limiters to implement their own statistics class, which could potentially have more statistics. Um, it's just a future growing area. That's fair. And then there okay, was... Sorry, this has already been asked. Oh. Do, do any of these need to be nullable? Like, are we confident that everyone can give a reasonable value, or is like, are we gonna have like negative one? Is I don't know, or like, um, I mean, it's hard to see how, like, current Q count. Like, if you don't have a Q, you just put zero. I mean, you could say null as in you don't have a Q, but zero also kind of, I don't know. I mean, there's technically different things, so maybe it could be nullable. You could argue for that. The only one I can almost think of is maybe if you don't have a great way to estimate available permits, but all of our existing ones do. So I, I think it's fine. I was just asking the question. Um, well, actually, that is a good point. Um, there is a team that uh, is looking to use this stuff, and they don't have available permits. They have like a percentage-based thing. So they don't have an exact available permits count that they can give back. Well, at least they can't easily. So that might need to be nullable in that case. I mean, it's a statistic being an estimate is still probably reasonable, or if they just yeah, send right. back five, meaning 5%, like that nothing says that because you see that it says five that you can call give me five units of rate limiting and it'll say yes i think the doc comments will say that um i think it has to have some meaning but i i, I see your point like i guess best here is good enough i don't think changing the interpretation of what it means makes sense does that mean or that it should be meaning? like current isn't a good name and we should do estimate or something or is that like implied by statistics i mean i think current conveys the notion that by the time you're looking at it it can be wrong and Okay. An estimate is another version of that same thing. Um, right, like you could have been, current could have been reading from a, you know, a non-volatile field that has a, hasn't been written or committed back to from another processor yet. And it's like, you know, whatever, it's... Mm -hmm. What you're really looking for from something like this is the trend over time in logs. Of, right. Oh, yep. About five minutes after we started up, we hit zero, and we stayed at zero for the next four hours, and we were queuing like crazy, and uh, and then the sun set, 
on the west coast of the United States, and we went back to being online. <laughs> right. Um, and then one last thing worth mentioning is that um, there was the idea of having basically a property bag, I don't, uh, just a random, like kind of like a, how HB request has the, I think, options or something. It's basically a string of objects. And you can just then add your own statistics to that. But that kind of might be mitigated by the fact that it's not sealed, so you can implement your own statistics class and add your own properties instead of adding it to some bag. <laughs> Bags are hard to work with. Yeah. I mean, the question is, who's the primary consumer of this, right? If the primary consumer is something like open telemetry or something that just dumps these key value pairs into some network message anyway, then I think a bag would be fine, right? If you actually expect code to do some math with that, yeah, then bags kind of (laughs) suck. Yeah, for the open API thing, if it was, they they implemented their own statistics (laughs) class, then it wouldn't know about that class, so it couldn't grab the new properties on that statistics thing, unless it did a bunch of reflection, right? Right. So if yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you expect a consumer to just basically send the data all to the server and then the server does some statistic processing, then it's probably going to be useless to expose them with strongly typed APIs in the client. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I mean, but I think the the problem with bags is I think you you. It's not. I mean, you can just. I mean, you of course can just say i dictionary of string comma string, right? But then. You know, in order for this to be useful, you would have to document what the strings are and what the ranges are, right? And blah blah blah. So you're, and that doesn't really have an idiomatic representation, right? You, you now have to basically go to the summary page of the API and then put a table there, right? And so mm-hmm. our normal process for reviewing things like this basically doesn't exist, right? And uh, you can totally shoot yourself by you know accidentally making breaking changes. And I think in your world it's even worse because you expect customers to implement these things and return strings right in a consistent fashion right so at the very minimum you probably want some sort of you know statics with well-known keys and say like you know if you want to implement this you know consider returning those keys and here are the semantics that these things should honor at which point it looks very closely to what you currently have right mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's in a really weird way the hybrid if if you know somebody comes back from open telemetry and says they really wish that you just had a bag approach would be that you add a you know, you add the dictionary and it's supposed to be the key is name of whatever the property is and value is either value to string or its object or whatever. And it's everybody who implements this is expected to set their dictionaries in the same pattern. So do both. Um, it doesn't sound great, but it, it all depends on what your usage is expected to be. Mm-hmm. If so it's... that would be copying the current, like the the four properties here as well into that dictionary, just for consistency's sake. Right, and it doesn't even have to be a real dictionary. Um, it could be a oh, true. an I dictionary that is looking at these names and returning the long. Yeah. Uh, or the other way around, that these just fetch values out of the dictionary. <laughs> but. Uh, I would probably say you used to have a number, now you have four numbers until somebody comes along and asks for the dictionary thing. I'd I'd probably just do what you have on screen. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, Yeah. Are they, I mean, are they, the names good? I know we went over current, but like total, I think that's probably fine. So, the, yeah, the only question I have on this first of all i guess uh, i don't is a lease and a permit are those one to one or is lease the number of times you called the api and permits is the sum of the values uh that yes what you just said okay so yeah for, you can have a lease with like 10 permits um or okay. one permit because so, yeah. i was going to ask is there risk of overflow and do you know what a provider should do with that uh if it's how many times was the was the method called? I don't really expect that to overflow, but given that you could 
have a resource provider and you're you know measuring bites uh then oh, your, yes. your total your permits total could permits could high. could easily wrap by you just keep asking for you know two to the 63 every time yep uh, but if it's um literally yeah, function call wrap. counts then no <laughs> then uh i yeah overflow doesn't seem like it would really be a problem yeah so i, I could easily see permit count wrapping but since it's current available, you would just, you know, if some provider has a notion of more than two to the 63 uh, permits, then just long dot max value. Oh, Close right. Enough. This isn't even total. Yeah, current is fine. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was asking on, on total yep. failed leases, is if that was going to, if that was adding more than one per call, then yep. uh, it would be scary. But add adding one, your process would need to run for a really long time. Yes. I mean, maybe a a centralized multi-node attached thing that has permanent aggregate uptime might roll over, but maybe they should redefine total to be today or something. So, yeah. So yeah, um, looks good to me. Anybody else? Um, foreshadowing a change that we're about to request. Can we name this resource <laughs> instead of resource ID since so this isn't any other thing? Yeah, I was, uh, I, I was going to ask that. Yes, that's a good point because, yeah, we can look at that like immediately after because we found an issue for it. Thank you, Brennan. <laughs> and I know Memory Cache did some crazy stuff to not make this costly um i'll probably need like reviewers to help me figure all that out if i want to do something similar but that's not api Introduce. Oh, we... Sorry, is could it... we quickly do the yeah that one? I was say, is it, it quick enough resource. that it's not rude to uh, Klaus? Uh, it looks pretty short. It's just resource ID to resource on all the APIs. Right, since the type is resource, the parameter name being resource makes way more sense than resource ID. Yes. yes. Any objections? Old. All right. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, Klaus. That's okay. You had a namespace somewhere, but I'm lazy. Oh, I still have it in the other window. I'll be slightly less lazy. Untriaged. Nice. All right, introduce commands and data context to WinForms to adapt to modern binding scenarios. Uh, this is WinForms issue 4895. Klaus, guten tag. Yes, yes, guten tag. <laughs> um, so that's a somewhat bigger one. Um, the reason is in recent years when, you know, Fox have my, started migrating WinForms app from framework to core, we see more and more asks from customers um, if we can give them a best practice alternative to one of the, well, to be honest, a bit more dreadful WinForms um, concepts, and that's you know putting business logic and code behind. So basically, their concerns always are they want to get rid of the spaghetti code that's quite too often the result when you use that code behind and. They want to be able to unit test um, their business logic that controls the UI. Um, and also in the process of migration, they want to be able to, you know, first in a feasible way, restructure their WinForms app in a way 
they can introduce some UI controller or even view models that they can then reuse in, in other scenarios like MAUI. And so all of those requests can at the moment be somewhat addressed already in WinForms with some sort, of, uh, some sort of controller or view model that you are then binding with WinForms existing data binding. But there are a couple of key features that are actually missing and which are probably showstoppers for that. And the first thing is that WinForms controls like buttons don't know about commands like they were introduced in WPF. And for MVVM, they're you know one of the central linchpins, I think. And then um, some of the WinForms controls, which in this context would be actually meant to support commands, are not even controls in the classical sense because they are components, but they have a visual representation. Um, and therefore, they not only lack the command property, but they're not bindable at all. Um, and that counts for everything that's derived from two-strip item. So the change we want to propose are, is con, you know, it's con, 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 consistent of, of, two, of four things, actually. Um, we want to first introduce um, command property or a command property on button base. Um, and then the second one is we want to make tool strip items in, in WinForms um, bindable per se. That's possible by implementing um, uh, the I bindable component on tool strip item. So if they become bindable, then we want to also, in the same way as with button base, um, provide you know the the two strip item with a command property that becomes bindable, and then to provide an easy way for third parties to implement a command functionality, which is then completely compatible with ours, um, we would propose an I command provider interface, which uses default interface methods to to implement the actual binding and control logic. Um, the reason behind that is, um, depends on how familiar you are with the MVVM concept, um, commands are getting bound, then the view model actually controls the availability of a command in the context. And depending on that, um, if they are available, the control gets enabled. And if they're not available, the control gets disabled. So there is some logic. It's not only the command that needs to be bound, it's also the logic that needs to be controlled. And so to make sure that we do that always in the same way, and if our if third parties will retrofit their controls um, with that to make sure that we are that they are doing that in the same way, um, we thought one way would be to to use default in interface methods that also hold at the same time. Um, the, the control logic for that. And then last uh, but not least, we want to introduce um, a data context property on control as an ambient property to, to provide an easy way um, for a data source to get automatically handed down to the individual children of a form or a user control. And um, it's not only we want to do that because WPF does that more or less in the same way, but we have the idea in mind that forms have usually binding source components, which classically manages the binding on the form. And then when you have additional user controls with their own binding source components, which then again have further binding, bindable user controls and so on, they're cascading down. So if, a control, if, if controls have their own data context property and get notified via data context change that the data source has changed um, for the whole chain, if you will, it's, it's really easy to assign the new data source to the respective binding source component at each respective level then. Um, and on top of that, it lets the data source itself become bindable through that new property, which makes it easier to cascade bindings from view models then to their respective child controls. Um, so that that's basically um, how that works. And there's one um, there's one animated 
GIF, GIF, I don't know, um, where this is a really quick example where I was showing that uh, I took a view model that was um, controlling the WinForms app, and then I took the same view model without any changes and just, you know, designed a very quick and dirty UI for an Android app. And it does exactly the same thing. So it's really possible then with commands and um, and those type of binding and wind forms that already exist to, uh, to, to enable those kind of scenarios. Um, and the other thing is that um, if you scroll a little bit down, there are a couple of, uh, of images also. So our designer picks those there. Our designer picks those things up, uh, up automatically. So there's no need to, for us to to do additional work in the designer. Um, actually, it's, it's quite quick to wire those things up. So once we have a view model and a binding source that represents that view model, um, you can just you know click on the menu item or click on a button and then assign the commands in just three mouse clicks. And that's I think is the typical way in in WinForms to uh, to do things still, um, and yeah, that that's basically the 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 concept of what we want to do. And then there's then the list of new APIs. And I already had a you know small chat with with Imo yesterday evening, so um, I'm not so sure anymore if using um, default interface methods is the right way. The idea behind it that I picked it first was um, it seems to be elegant and it seems to be just one piece that you have to you know take and retrofit um, whatever control you have uh, with it um, yeah but there might be other approaches to that um, what well, what is necessary is um, an existing control um, has to get um, a command property of type i command has to get um, a command parameter so that the command parameter can be you know passed to the to the method that should be executed in the in the view model. Um, it needs the enabled property so um, when the context changes, uh, so the execution context changes, um, that the view model can indirectly um, enable or disable the control based on the context. And then the other methods that are in this interface you know, are protected, so they can only be called from the implementing, uh, implementing class but are not um, exposed further, um, are just infrastructure things. Um, also, what you will see is that, for example, if we are retrofitting a property in WinForms, then we always need to do two additional things. Um, we will have a correlating method that um, that raises an event that the property has changed. And we need that because that's basically the way that binding works and informs when when things gets gets bound uh, back to the to the data source. So um, if you bind something on property change, then uh, I don't know, a text box changes its, its text, then on changing the text, it's raising the text change event and via reflection, the binding engine um, you know, gets that notification and then it can update the, um, the data source. And that's the reason why um, if you, you know, Take a look at the list of what methods and events get or proposed to implement in addition to the to the to the new properties. Um, they're, they're just for meeting the conventions that we have in WinForms for um, for making the binding in both directions work. And that's pretty much the, the idea and the concept behind it. Anything with an access member in a interface had to have a body. I mean, I, I guess this does because 
get set has a body, but like the raise command changed. I thought if you had an access modifier, it had to be dimmed. That could be wrong. It's newer than C sharp four, so it's not a feature I'm familiar with. No one left. I mean, there is an um, there is a demo implementation of how it looks like to to implement um, I don't know a, a control based on that interface. So um, that would be I, I think it's a, it's a couple of uh, couple of pages down. Um, well, just like this, you know, the request command execute. You've shown it here with an empty body, which makes sense. Um, the previous enabled status technically has an implementation, but that requires storage, which I didn't think interfaces were allowed to define. And then these have no body, so I'm like I'm just I'm confused if this is even legal C sharp personally. But so this is just the list on. Of the new APIs, but as I said, the actual implementation then is um, is, is a little bit down, and uh, you know, where, where it says uh, what we are what we're actually doing. So th this is legal um, C sharp since it's actually implemented in button base and and uh, and in two strip item in my in my demo branch. So, but this is this is what you so you would take the interface and do exactly that. Uh, what you see on the screen, and that would make the whole logic work then. So the alternative, and this is what I discussed with Emil yesterday, the, the alternative would be we, we just have an interface uh, that define the absolute necessary methods and properties or events that we need to, to meet WinForms conventions. And then instead of providing the logic for that, um, as default interface methods, we would just have a class that does the controlling of that, and this class is hosted inside um, the respective control that want to do that. What we cannot do is, you know, providing a base functionality on control or component already, because we, we only want selected controls to have um, commands. So it doesn't make any sense to have a command on a text box. Um, and also, neither Maui nor, nor WPF have that kind of you know inheritance from from the top to the to every last control. We just have it on you know button base and two strip item. Only those who are actually able to uh, have a meaningful way to raise a command on on the view model side then. Yeah, basically my suggestion boils down to taking all the members that are currently on the interface, putting them on an abstract base type, and then effectively saying a control component, whatever that wants to participate, has to have one of those as a member, right? And then in order to formalize that, we could define an interface that says, you know, I can has command, and then that that thing is just a single property or method that returns yeah. this other thing that has the base type, right? And this way you can. Because the problem of interfaces is we can never version them, right? And if we just look at what you already have on the interface, there is a lot of infrastructure stuff for which my personal confidence level that we will never ever add to this is super low. Because it seems like, like I can't explain half the members, right? And, and I think you arrived at those members too by effectively implementing the stuff and says, here's the stuff that I need to implement this. And that tends to change with time as your implementation evolves, as you support other features and then you end up in a world where you would like, well, I would like to add a member to this interface. And then the answer is you cannot, like it's an interface. So then, and and the other problem is because it's a lot of members, any command that needs to participate in this, you ask to implement a ton of stuff, right? So like if you do this split, as I suggested, at least you could imagine now an inheritance hierarchy on this other thing that, you know, centralizes some stuff and gives people like base types where they only have to maybe override two methods and have the rest just work, right? I, so I get that, but what I didn't understand is how would you how would you use an abstract class? I mean, you, what, what are you deriving from that ab abstract class? That, that I didn't so what you to. So what you would do is you would basically say, instead of having command provider, it's a, you basically would change this thing from public interface, I command provider to public abstract command provider, right? Make it just an abstract base type. 
Then you would have another interface called, uh, you know, I don't know, public interface. I command provider, provider, manager, factory, pick a name, right? <laughs> and that thing only has one member on it that is basically giving you an instance of command provider. And so what you're now saying is that if, a, let, let's say, a, you know, a button wants to support this, now button implements this interface. And yeah. so now button can have a field of type command provider and that just returns this thing, right? So this way you can, you you, you have an, I mean, you basically have a hierarchy on the side that, that you that you yeah. that you then inject effectively into those types. So the problem is that we need the property, the command property as a first level property on the command, because otherwise it would not be bound, bindable. I mean, you, the problem is that the, the the property on that level needs to raise the command change um, event, and the sender must be the class, it must not be the class that it is hosted by that by that control right because otherwise the binding would not work right so another option you have is, is but can you scroll down a bit so this is this is an alternative idea that after the discussion um i was thinking of i mean it's not really you know baked yet but um the, there is a, a set so open for discussion it's not it's a little bit um yeah stop stop stop, stop there so I was thinking that we could, you know, implement just um, something that I would call I command binding target, because to be honest, it's not a command provider. It is more a command property provider. The command provider is the view model. So there was a little bit of a of a slip up on my side from um, for, for the naming, but I only got that when I was talking to you um, yesterday evening. But then so. At least we would need to have the command change as an event, the command um, be enabled, because that's important to control the whole thing, and then the command parameter. I would implement that on, let's say, button base or or, um, or two strip item, and then I would have an additional um, class, uh, which I then really call command provider, because that you know, is, is actually the command logic provider, where I do all the the things that that are now you know implemented as the default interface methods here and that thing that can just be internally um, used um, of the you know by the command uh, by by the control or by the bootstrap item that needs to handle that or from the third parties. I mean, basically, the whole thing is to just provide means for third parties to to just do it the same way that we do it when we are when we're providing the logic and that they don't have to reinvent the wheel all over again practically so, we can we, we don't need all that stuff we can just say if you want to retrofit it this needs to be there and you know take care of that yourselves but i just want to provide a way to to do it always the same way and that was my motivation behind of you know giving the logic also along with the interface or so i mean there, there's there's two ways you could do this too right so another option is i mean we generally don't have winforms interfaces like i clickable right? that that formalizes the click event right you basically just say if you know basically most of the stuff ends up being on control or component but then there's this parallel hierarchy like what toolstrip has done for example where it's more like convention, right? The tool strip has a, has a clicked event similar to a button, right? But yeah. there's no interface that, that says, you know, what it means to be clickable, right? It's just by convention, they have the same properties, right? So you could do the same here. You could just say you introduce a new subclass of control, right? Like, I don't know, command control, let's say, right? That defines all the things you want. And then we can yeah. just take any existing type, like button that currently just extends control or, you know, take button base, right? That extends control. Yeah. And then just say those we just retarget to now derive from com from command control, right? And then we yeah. could do the same thing for toolchip or whatever other disjoint hierarchy you have. Right? You'd, like interfaces would be really useful if any object in the world or any type in the world could be I commandable, right? But that's not really what you want to do. Like there's a there's a relatively small number of inheritance classes where that would make sense. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I think introducing interfaces just overkill. So if you just say screw it, I just copy paste whatever the basic infrastructure is into the three or four base types that we ship. And then any third party just changes their code to derive from those rather than from whatever the base type is they currently have. That wouldn't even be a breaking change, right? So, you know, so long, of course, the new base type is a, 
uh, you know, a subtype of what they're currently inheriting from, right? And then this way, it's a pretty straightforward way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to just say, you know, you don't make this a, a, an opt-in thing, you just add the whole thing to control. And then there's a secondary property that is kind of like, you know, protected that a base type overrides that basically turns it on. And then you basically just say, okay, button overrides it to turn it on, right? And then maybe you do some magic in the property grid to remove those things if this thing is true or false, right? Depending on how you want to, well, that's the semantics true. you want. So but that's another way of also, doing it. We also want to have that on component in, in one case. So then we would even go further down the road and that, that yeah. then component is not in, in Bitform's component is in the runtime. Is it? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But I mean, I don't but know still, how I mean, low, I don't know how low command is. But I mean, again, like you, you do, you don't have to have to put it literally in component. You could have it in command component, right? And that could live at a higher level, right? And then you just change whoever currently extends component to inherit from command component, right? And, and that, would, that would not be a breaking change. No, inserting a type is a safe thing to do. We have done this with reflection. That's how we made the whole. The whole terrible .NET framework, .NET Core reflection split work, <laughs> but introduce, but inserting a type in the hierarchy is fine. I mean, I say that. I mean, like, I, I mean, I'm sure there's some serialization impact, maybe, but I don't think you serialize those things, so it should be fine. Um, but that I, I don't know. Like, if, if you really get down to three or four properties. And maybe the interface is fine, but the, the way you have it right now here is like there's like 12 members on them or something. Like, I don't think that's the final shape. <laughs> that's your V1 shape. And then there's going to be a V2 shape and a V3 shape. And then you really have to figure out how you version this. And I just don't think you can. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah. basically do, a, you know, command provider two, command provider three, but then that would make your life now really complicated because presumably now there's different features that you would expose there or different behaviors and you may not be able to do this pay for play in the sense that oh yeah half the stuff on the form is you know i command provider two and the other half is i command provider three and then have some same semantics around this right so yeah you're probably be better honest, off after, just saying it's a big to be step. honest after we after we discussed yesterday i um i slept over it and uh I'm of the same opinion that um, so there's that, that's why I said we need to you know for that go back to um, to the team and and discuss alternatives. Also, the thing with the naming is 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 not you know after I spoke with you, it's not precise enough for me anymore. It's just confusing because I mean I I pretty much tripped over it myself, right, yesterday and um, was confused. So, so yeah, there, there's that. But, but also I want to have feedback about, you know, the thing at all. Um, I think it's important. I think it's a cool thing to, to help migrating and also to get, to get people, especially ISVs, um, to remodel their app and have an easier way to, uh, to get access also to, you know, like, you know, migrating away from on-site um, things that they have, um, like in, you know, accessing SQL Server directly from, from code behind as they did that for the last 10 years. And then with with the incentive to to modernize it to, um, to things like MAUI um, is something like, um, a double reward for them. They, they're getting the one, and they can also um, get rid of their on-site, um, you know, SQL Server installations, and then rather use um, um, Azure stuff. And I think that's that's a really important thing for WinForms to to modernize the the back end for for such apps. Yeah, I mean, I think the feature overall makes since it gives people a way to start a transition instead of telling them throw everything away and start over. Right. No, I also think you want something that you can give feedback on. So another thing to consider is like, I don't know, do you need, like does this feature require changes to the designer at all? Or is it just no. in, in the runtime? 
you know, it's just the runtime. So the, as I said, the designer picks those changes up directly and it doesn't really care about the type. For, for, you know, from the perspective of the designer, it's just another type that he has to deal with, um, but right. it doesn't really care about what type it is. So the assignment from the view model command to the, um, to, to the, to the control is, is just happening. I, I didn't do anything with that, um, which is, which is cool, but, but also expected. Right. Yeah. I was thinking for a moment that, um, you may want to ship a new package, but then I forgot that you want button to just have a command property and you can't do this with a new package. So you can only, you would only provide new types of new packages. So that wouldn't really help your case. It yeah, would, but... would it, would allow third parties that build their own custom controls to take advantage of that, but that's like 0.03% of your customers, so it's probably not that useful. Um, exactly. Yeah, I well, think I mean, that also, also again, you know, with a with the WinForms audience in mind, discoverability is really a thing. It should be just very easy to to pick those things up. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Totally. I think that. Yeah, I mean, one option you have is, and I think that's, I don't know how big your design is, but like based on the, on the shape discussions we have, like it might be worthwhile to just, you know, build the whole thing out and then just have the whole thing work across all the things you have. I don't know how far your prototype is. And then, you know, maybe just, you know, look at this from there. Okay, now we have that. What would it mean for custom controls? And then validate the whole thing. And then when you have confidence that the whole thing works, that the, that the naming is, somewhere you want it to be, then we can do an API review of your final shape. Yeah, I think the, so the, the thing is, uh, most of the things are really low hanging fruits because um, most of the infrastructure that, that, that I need is already there. And right. um, it's not a big deal to, to refactor that and make it work. So this, there is a, there's a branch that I have a run, uh, that I have in the runtime that works. And the demo that you see is actually, you know, based on on, on what I did, um, it's it's an actual implementation. But to to redo that is not a big deal because um, the code just lives at another place. Then, but right. it, it stays basically the same. And on the control side, the only thing I really need for binding is a command property of type i command. That's it. Right. Um, I, I, to to meet the other UI stacks. But that's just a verbal convention. Is we need a command parameter to pass along. But I mean that that could have happened another way. But we just decided in WPF to do it that way, and then we decided in Maui to do it that way. So let's do it here the same way. Right. That was my right. thinking. But there's nothing that really um, you know dictates that in a way of you know having an interface or something. And so um, command and command parameter and the enabled, which is already there on control um, to, to to have a visual visual representation if, if a command is in the context available or not that's right. the only thing i need everything else is just um it doesn't really yeah. matter from that point of view how it's been implemented yeah i meant more like the rest of the shape you have right the race for example like a, is that standard wind forms naming convention no yeah, that, so at that point it become it became a little bit stilted um, because I was so you know kind of fixed on the thought of the default interface methods. It's just the problem is with an interface I cannot have um, I cannot have a class obliged that it needs to be implementing something in a protected way, right? I can either it's public or I, I do an uh, implicit uh, an explicit interface implementation, but there is a WinForms convention that that is, if you have a property that should be bindable, then you need a protected virtual method that raises the event. And okay. then you need okay. also the event, which is named in the same style of the property. So text yes. means yes. you have to have text change. Since I cannot put that in an interface, I invented a new convention that race command change implementing in a in a control then is the hook where you are where you put that in on command change and race command can execute change you would put in on 
command can execute change because all those methods you need to meet the WinForms conventions. And yes, I agree. That seemed to be a little bit stilted, um, but... Um, and this goes back to like, who's like, do you, is there any part in your system that actually consumes an I command provider? Or do you only use it as a way to say, if you provide this functionality, here's the member that you should have? It is, it is a convenient way to implement the logic. It is not something from where, where you technically um, need the interface because an interface at one point is consumed as an interface. Right. That that kind of confirms what I said earlier. So I would at that point just get rid of the interface and I would just say, here's the shape that we think we have, which is, as you said, it's basically how WinForms works today as well, right? There's no interfaces for you know, text, text change, right? It's just, it's a convention that this is, this is the naming yeah. that we chose and then you just have to adhere to that. And that goes with, oh, this is protected, this is public, this is settable, this is gettable, right? Uh, what are the parameter names and all of that? So I think that would be fine. So I think if you would just, okay. if you just take your design, remove the interface and just say, yep, I added those members, you know, this is the shape. And then I, I did this shape, copy paste on button base and tool strip base, whatever it is, or tool strip item. And you know that's what ended up with the functionality. I think that would be fine. I think then you could again make this a blog post and say like you know if you're Telerik or Def Express or somebody else, here's what you should do to your controls. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be a fine way of doing it. Okay. I mean, I'm a little bit unsure still why, why you need previous enabled status. That seems also kind of like a somewhat well, of a of a hacking <laughs> implementation, but I don't know. I mean, the thing is that if you if you assign a if you don't assign a command, then and you have the enabled uh, property uh, set or or not set. So in in contrast of the default value, then you need to just remember the old the previous state when you don't when when you get rid of a command, right? Because then you want to reinstate the enabled status as it was when no command was in charge to change enabled based off, based off the context. So you need some way to to reinstate the original um, enabled state when you are assigning nothing to the command because you want to get rid of the command. That's the only way. But that's the only reason that, that you so need you the previous state stored somehow. and. Do you only need it for a case when people like assign a command and then unassign a command to not lose the enabled property value? Yeah, or rather restore the previous. Yeah. I mean, is that, it, I mean, is that, is that a common thing though? Like I thought you assign a command once and then, you know, you, you leave that forever. Like, are you, are you changing commands a lot? Actually, it's it's pretty static. I mean, if you if you assign the view model at the beginning, the commands usually never change. Um, right. That's true. Um, I mean, that to me is like kind of like there's other things in WinForms that has similar behavior, right? Where you, let's say, you dock an item, right, and then you later change your mind and undock it. I don't think we restore the original position either, right? It's just like, well, now it's just at the top, right? Because the oh, previous one was dock top, and so tough luck. You would be surprised in, 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 in how many how many ways we do that actually. So, for example, if you um, if you are um, if you're changing the a text box from multi-line to to single line and back, then the original intended sizes of the multi-line text box is indeed restored, but that goes only so far as you close the form and reopen it because of course it's not stored or it's not serialized then in code. But uh, in the same session, if you switch between multi-line and single line, the size is restored. So uh, yeah, but, but, that, but that is uh, then the designer for, for state, docking right? controls. For docking controls, that's true, but it, it depends. Maybe it's an overkill, yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, it's like an, it, it's kind of like goes to like let's say how um, you know an editor has an undo buffer, right? So like it, it, it seems fine to say like you have some sort of designer state where you remember a certain amount of things, right? But we don't store the undo stack in the controls either, right? Like there is some amount of so that that, that seems to me like kind of like an editor concept more than a runtime concept. If that makes sense, that's why I mm -hmm. thought it looked a bit odd to have that here. 
Like I have yeah. no idea how the rest of Inform is implemented. If that's the pattern and it just happens to be private normally, then yeah, I guess getting rid of the interface would allow you to make those things private as well. In which case we no longer see this as a public API. Um, so yeah, it just like, to me it just seems odd to say like we have more APIs on the button to facilitate something that happens once or twice when you design the form. That seems a bit overkill, but. That, that's true. I mean, and, and, and also uh, it's very likely I mean, it's highly likely that we're not going to do the that over the interface, and then it becomes really a small implementation detail. Right. Yeah, because I mean, basically, the enabled property would, assuming that command has enabled, it would be like, uh, if I have a command, then return command enabled. Otherwise, return my enabled field, and then the set does whatever the set does. Yeah. Um, where now that you have that field, you 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 have the behavior you've implemented it yeah. in command control. So what I doodled um, was the last thing we talked about of basically introduce a new layer in the middle of control that has whatever you need. I didn't trim it at all. Um, and then the you know, button base and tool strip or whatever, um, we would insert the, the type here. That, that seems to be the direction that uh, we were leaning and that emo did a lot of talking and I did a lot of agreeing in my head. And, uh, so that, that seems to be the main note, at least for this aspect of the, the interface is really just too big and that's. Yeah. A, I get that. A version in concern. And so a, an alternative needs to be done. The one that you had here also looks uh, reasonable if if this works better for like I don't know if there are a bunch of control libraries that actually exist in things like NuGet and that it would be like well a you know fancy button I guess a fancy button extended button base uh, but if you know you end up I with mean, I mean, a fancy some uh, control that like it can't you you as the consumer can't insert a base class there, and can you get them to update to the new model if they need to? And versus if it's just fine, you make your own derived thing and say I'm a binding I mean, target. The, the yeah. thing is, when we when we are inserting something into control, then they have no chance. They they just got updated then, um, and then the same thing is. But I'm I would be more concerned with components that have a visual representation. Uh, two strip item being one of them. So they're not really derived from control. They're, they're derived from component. And then we, in addition to now implement I bindable component to make them bindable at all, because components are not, uh, are not bindable by standard. You, you need to implement that interface. That is one of the changes of this proposal also. And then uh, we need to make that thing uh, equip it with a command and and that's only an individual component that that's definitely not for all components it's just two strip item that needs to become bindable because the other components don't okay. just make sense um so so this you know doing it this way to, to have something like i i command binding target um would again make the whole thing easier to retrofit, and then you could just implement the command provider inside of the component, pass uh, the I command binding target, and then have all the logic inside of the command providing, you know, doing the enabling, the disabling on binding, binding the event, releasing the event when it's no longer necessary, and track the command context and stuff like that. That that was that that's the second idea. Um, but still, I'm I think we just want to go back to the WinForms team and discuss that, what, what what approaches we have based on the feedback that we just got. And then if inserting would not work uh, or we have concerns, then uh, yeah, we just need a you know second run. It would have been just nice to, to get it out for, for .NET 7 to put it in preview, um, but I think I, uh, yeah. It, it, I, I think it would be rushed now, and so um, that that's not it's not good. Right. Yeah. Are there independent aspects that we should also talk about today? <clears throat> uh, 
uh, what I mean. Um, well, if we've, if the only thing we've concluded so far is I command provider is the wrong shape and, and you're going to go off and rethink that, is there another sort of independent piece that you also want to talk oh. about? Well, data context is, is completely uh, independent of that. Um, it is just an additional ambient property that we would put on um, on control itself. And um, the reason is, uh, with ambient property, I mean, so the idea is you assign, uh, you assign it to the form and the form hosts um, 20 controls in its control collection, one of it being a user control, that again hosts 20 controls, one of them being a user control or a scrollable control. And so it's the same as with font or with back color in WinForms, an ambient property just hands down it value to the, to the controls it's hosting. And this is just a convenient feature um, so that you would assign a data source to the form, then the data context or the data source would be handed down to each respective um, control, and they would be notified that the, that the context has changed. And the idea behind it is that in contrast to WPF, we have a binding source component that is controlling the data binding on a form or a user control. And if you start to, as you do that in typical line of business applications to cascade your form with business controls, then user controls, then you have a form and you have a user control and then you have a user control inside a user control and each of, of those things have their own binding components. And if you, it's a nightmare just to maintain those, those data sources in a consistent way. So the idea is to have a data context and the data context change event, then it's very easy for each respective user control to get notified that the data context has changed and that then it can be doing whatever uh, it, 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 it you know needs to do with the data source, assigning it to one or several binding sources. And so this is just a central hooking point and it makes the whole thing also more intuitive for people who already, you know, have um, know the data context from from WPF apps, that's the idea behind it. It doesn't use any, it, it doesn't break anything. It's just holds an, an object, and only then if you actually assign it. Um, so it doesn't really waste any any memory. It's really just a convenient way to to propagate um, data sources along the hierarchy of the controls of a container. Yeah, I mean the like to me this looks reasonable. The only question, the questions I have is, would this kind of change be a blind fire, or should it be a old like w the pattern where it in the event it gives you the old and the new value at the same time, um, and then the fact that there's an on parent to raise the event. It's a convention of that. That's again, it's win. It's WinForms okay. um, convention for ambient properties. Um, it's just the same standard as every other ambient property is in, uh, is implemented in WinForms. Fair enough. Um, but yeah. So my only question then is, should this be a something richer than event handler that does the before and after? And I don't. The WPF version is just dependency property changed, but I don't know if that inherently is an old new or if it's just I mean, a blind fire. I don't know if the old data source would be kind of redundant because um, a reference of the old data source is already inside, let's say the user control in terms of you assigning it to a binding source, uh, for example. So you have the old binding source, uh, you have the old data source at that point. If you're getting a new one and uh, then you can decide, do I take the new one or not, um, you can compare it against the old one because you, you you still have the reference. It's completely the decision of the um, of the implementing user control or whatever control um, if it want to track the the old one or the new one. So and well, also in, to clean it up. 
in a changed event, since that's the past tense version, it should mean that the data context property has already been reassigned. It, that's true, yeah. So you would no longer have a reference to the old one unless you intentionally scrolled it away ahead of time. Yeah, but I mean, especially for Winfo, I mean, you, you store it at a different place and that doesn't get changed, right? I mean, it's not automatically. You have to handle the data context change and then assign the new one. You, you pass it on. It okay. Get changed automatically. If, that, if that's idiomatic. I've never designed a control, so. Well, so, so I, don't, the, I would have assumed you just read the property. I have a, I mean, this is this is something that that's really in the future. But my, my concern, I haven't really, you know. My, my concern is that when it, when it comes to trimming and um, you know, to trimming of WinForms app, is that we have so much reflection going on that on long term we might be thinking about you know getting rid of the of the current reflection base um, binding engine and then you know go in the direction of, of code generation and 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 doing the, the, the data binding based on code generation. And and then we could, you know, also have a, a still more compatible way to to use this um, uh, even in an automatic way uh, if we wanted to. So there might be a, a yet another aspect that, that we could use that in the future. But that's not the primary idea I had behind it. It would just be a, a side effect that, that might be useful in the future. Should we ever decide to uh, get rid of the, the reflection-based binding and uh, replace it through just an idea? <laughs> Were you shaking your head, Emo, when you heard that? Well, it's like every time we say we can get rid of some reflection code, like it's, it's actually like, Especially when you say we move to source generation, like I, I would say the proof is in the pudding. It's for, for yeah, probably very difficult to actually design this thing into and to make sure that everything just works right. I mean, I mean, I would agree with you that it would be desirable, but I think it's a it's a bit hard to validate or justify design that we want to ship now for this hypothetical thing of that we may want to do in two years from now, right? Because by the but, time we get there, it's probably going to be very difficult or different. That, yeah, that's fine. But I think that, so. The, but still, the primary or the primary motivation is really to to streamline the experience and to have an easy way and a consistent way to guarantee for the for the user um, a consistent way to not miss a reassignment of the data source when it when it's due, so to say. Right. Yep. And then I assume that you don't want to add this in seven and do the other part in eight. Or do you? Uh, say that again. I... Uh, the part here with data context and data context change and stuff, you uh, do you want to add that now in seven or uh, is it no. going to? Okay. No, no, no. I I want to I want to have it uh, as a whole uh, or 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 not at all. So I, I it just I I think it makes more sense to to then also you know introduce it in a blog post um, in in the context of everything. It, it's not, I mean, we could separate it, it but um, it. Oh, I'm just knowing yeah, what to write down in the notes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's true, but uh, it could be possible, but my, my stomach feeling says, no, let's do it in a package. <laughs> yep, that sounds good to me. I just didn't know if we needed to break it apart into a, approved section and a needs work section or um, or what but okay so what I have is we don't like the big interface we talked about injecting a base class uh, also doing something like I command binding target whichever of those you feel is going to work out better like um, and then we did also look at data context and on control and that part looks reasonable um, but really the the point that I of was there anything else is you know if you had a second piece here and it was going to be sort of 
rework around the same time that we didn't look at only the first one and then when you come back then we now are like well we don't like the second one either so <laughs> yeah no, but yeah it's cool sounds like a fun thing so yeah. then we just mark it as api needs work and uh that close come back at some point yep unless there's anything else from this class no okay i'm i'm good otherwise Awesome. Thanks. By the way, I, I think it's a good feature. I, oh. To be honest, I never used data binding in WinForms, but I've used it excessively in WPF. So. <laughs> Should we just do all the crypto yeah. ones, given that you're here and we have 20 minutes left? <laughs> yeah. See how much we can get through. All right. So add x509 subject alternative name as a rich type. I guess I'll give a little bit of an overview of, in a sense, these four things together are all one feature. Um, it's people want to be able to load a certificate signing request and then signs, you know, sign one to create a certificate after it. And this is basically all of the prereq work we need to do of what are questions that if you loaded it, you couldn't currently answer. And so one of them is uh, we, we added in a previous version uh, the ability to create a subject alternative name extension, uh, but we didn't add the ability to read one back. Uh, this proposal is still going, is not the full version of what the extension can hold because that's big and complicated and it's not worth doing. Um, but this allows sort of the 98% uh, use case, and then if you're in the last 2%, you basically have to fall back to uh, ASN Reader. <coughs> and yeah, so right now, uh, all of our extension types have a two string. They also have a format which does the same thing, um, except it takes a Boolean. And people parse it. Uh, we've seen this in multiple places. WCF definitely had. Part, just text parsing of Windows 2 string and they got bit by both of the aspects of concern there of uh, Windows loc and Unix is not Windows. <laughs> so um, for the extension itself basically we have the same extension constructors that we uh, generally have of you can build an empty one which you then get to uh, populate from we have a copy from which is intended for you built a base type and then found there was a rich type and then you just load the data in um, but so it default constructor a constructor given the uh, data that's already there in sp array and span uh, all extensions have this notion of critical it's just a bit that gets serialized into the output uh, the RFC says subject alternative name extension should be non-critical, so I defaulted this to false. And then the only two things we'll let you do off of it is you can ask what are all the registered DNS names and then what are all the registered IP addresses, um, which can be IPv4 or IPv6. And again, it, it holds a whole bunch of other kinds of data, um, but these are the only two that really make sense for us to expose. And so that's all I did. But the real thing somebody wants to do if they're looking at one of these extensions and they're not being a CA is just ask, I'm looking at a certificate, is it valid for this particular host name? And so for that, on X509 certificate two, the proposal is add a new member called matches host name where you can give it the host name. And then you can say like, you don't want to allow wildcard processing and you don't want to allow falling back to the the common name in the subject and uh, yeah this one will it has two quirks that are interesting to discuss to see if we even want to have it one it will not be used by SSL stream SSL stream at least I don't think we should SSL stream will do what the host OS would do which may differ from what the answer this gives and uh, number two is if the host name 
parses as an IP address, then we apply IP addressing rules instead of DNS rules instead of making them two separate methods. Okay. Comments? I assume Sorry, both constructors just... copy, right? Yes. Uh, I missed, you said uh, SSL stream won't use it. Who is it? Who will use it? So, in, in again, uh, hand wave 99% of the time, they should give the same answer. One notable exception would be uh, that, and, and I'm saying why it doesn't work before I say who would use it, uh, is open SSL in their implementation of wildcard matching, they do not consider underscores as valid hostname characters. So if you have a, you know, hello underscore world dot example dot org, they don't say that's a match for star dot example dot org. Windows does. Um, so that would be a place where SSL stream calling the OS would give a different answer than this, um, because this I think I did the Windows one. I didn't say underscores illegal. Uh, so, but the people who would call this, assuming they're not hitting the underscore case, is you do something like open your My Certificate store and you're looping through and you're looking for the first certificate that matches host name of whatever property you think you're serving. So it's but you, certificate you, selection, basically, is who would use this. But you couldn't reliably use it if you were also using SSL stream because it might do something different? Well, I mean, so you couldn't, uh, let's say you just couldn't reliably use it because, uh, and that's going to be true no matter what, because if you're on, if we made this defer to the OS and you're on Windows, then Windows would say underscores match. And, but then if you are now, if a open SSL based client connects to you, whether it be us or curl or whatever, that would come back and say the certificate's no good for the host name I was talking to. So you're you're st you're going to end up in the in the edge cases you're going to have cross OS communication problems. But in the in the common case, it's it should it would be the same answers. So it's technically unreliable, but mostly reliable. It is another. I'm trying to. Uh, piece together what you just said is a summary we expect people to call this and accept the fact that they might sometimes in those corner cases get the wrong answer yes you're setting your feature very well i have to say i know so <laughs> right so again if you're if you're looking for a if you don't have uh, underscores are the only problem that i know about if you don't have an underscore in your host name that's being matched with a wild card uh, it should be the same answer on Windows and Linux, and it should match what the host is doing. But because this is implemented in managed code, and not just asking the host for the you know what the result was, then uh, it may differ from the host OS's implementation. Uh, in particular, for SSL stream on Windows, when we get back the uh, the certificate context, while we rebuild the chain ourselves, we just ask, like, they give us a bit that says if it matched the host name or not, and that goes straight into the SSL flags value. We don't ask a question independently. I mean, we could. We could throw that away and always go with a managed interpretation, but then now you start coming into the, like, well, SSL stream on Windows, or sorry, SSL stream on Windows and a Windows native app disagreed on whether or not this matched and that it gets weird but this will solve the problem for other things that are not SSL stream but I'm still missing like how, how these extensions being used are they basically added to the certificate or how does it work so the all the things that are x509 extension is in a in a certificate there's just the open bag of extra stuff that gets added later uh, that's not what I want. Which we have as an extensions property. That's not what I want. X509 certificate. So we just have this collection of 
what are all of the extensions. And they, they're called extensions because that's what they're called in the file format. It's just an open-ended way of adding new data without revving the file format. And I guess that consumption experience then usually is like when you when you create a third, we parse out the extensions and then we create this instance of the type and the consumer would just try cast this thing and then that's how they would call the numeroid DNS names, for example, and numeroid IP addresses. Is that the idea? Yeah, basically, you know, for each or, you know, use the link uh, of type. Yeah. And get the one that was the type that you expected. Uh, we have... Do you show hierarchy in this thing? I don't think you do. Order. I mean, not the hierarchy. You have to click on it a few times, but... Yeah. Well, if I just go to the namespace, right? We have, like, you know, there's the basic constraints extension, the EKU extension, the KU extension. Like, we already have a whole bunch of them. This is just one of the ones from the standard that we just haven't had gotcha. a reader for yet. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah, I think that makes sense to me. And I suppose we can't call into the OS because they don't expose it at granularity level, but we could actually say, give me the same semantics that the OS uses, right? Uh, it, it's at least difficult. In the case of Windows, I don't think it's present at all. Um, yeah. In Mac, we had to come up with a convoluted way of getting the answer. And then I don't know what we would do in Android, etc. So, I mean, not that Android. Actually, Android has certificates. It's a browser that doesn't. But yeah. It, asking the OS is something we could do on OS is where it's possible, but I, I think that just going with the one managed implementation it's good enough. is good enough for the you know 98 plus percent case. Don't use underscores. Yeah, I, I totally trust you made up stat, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> yeah, the un underscore with a wild card match is like is the only thing that I've seen where somebody complains. Uh, on Linux, SSL stream says it didn't match the host, and on Windows it did, and I've never seen the other direction. Yeah, arguably that's just the the domain seems to be busted, right? You can't have it super consistent. Then no matter what we do, right? We can just decide that we have give you the same answer on the same OS, but then that still means if your code is cross-platform, then you still have inconsistencies no matter what we do. Right, and that's why I felt that the managed implementation here is good enough. Right. Yeah, I buy that. So I guess unless somebody else objects, prove and move on. <laughs> It's mostly all big API services. Huh. I think the distinguished name is the shortest. But <clears throat> probably true. Okay. Um, so certificates, as I'm sure some of you have seen at some point, have long and complicated names with you know. CNs and O's and STs or S's and, and whatever. And while we have on the X509 distinguished name type, you can two string it and we'll give you back, you know, that full complicated thing. If you want to read, for example, just the piece that says CN, um, that's good luck and use ASN reader or try and parse the text and that's uh, complicated because there are quoting rules and such. So um, sticking with my theme of enumeration, uh, inside, a, inside the thing that's called a distinguished name, you get what's called a relative distinguished name. Uh, and so what I, I've made a type for the relative distinguished name and then have enumerate relative distinguished names. Um, the short form would be RDNs, which is all that they ever get referred to by 
people in the industry, but I assume no one here would know what that means, which means it wouldn't qualify for compaction. <laughs> and then uh, we'll come back to this reverse notion. So RDNs themselves are stupidly complicated, um, which the original issue here talks about. So we get simple things like we just have, you know, comma C equal Denmark. And so this is a, a simple or single valued relative distinguished name. There's also the encoding allows you to have one relative distinguished name that has two different pieces that belong together. So in this case, the first comma we see came here. So the first RDN is actually the common name John John and the serial number whatever. So this is a multi-value RDN and they're stupid and they break things and no one should use them. And so the API says, just has a Boolean, this is stupid. And if this is true, you have to use ASN Reader. Um, and if this is false, then uh, it will tell you, it uses an OID to say what the semantic type is. So instead of being the letters CN, it's actually a dotted decimal. Well, actually, it's a weird thing, but let's call it the dotted decimal. So we'll tell you this is the data type it has uh, as by the OID. So that's why I called it single value type. And then a, which is a property, and then a method, which could use some love on the name, uh, get single value because you have a single value value because you want the value of the single value. Uh, this is a uh, nullable string because not all of the data types have to be strings. So, mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's very rare. I had to dig through several specs before I found one where the data type wasn't a string, um, but I found it and so I added the question mark. So if you have a data type that says it's not uh, a string, then this will, well, if the encoding says it's not a string, this will return null. And then you would have to fall back to reading the raw data with ASN Reader to understand what the, the payload was. The reversed on the enumerator is because most of the two strings, uh, for reasons that probably made sense to somebody in 1978, if you take one of these relative distinguished names, the recommended approach when you two string it is to treat it like it was a stack. So you print the last thing first, which we call reversed mode. Um, and so this defaults to reversed, meaning it will walk them in the same order that you would see in the two string. Um, but the encoding goes, you know, non-reversed. So in the encoding of the sample one here, C equal DK is actually the first thing that you would run across in the file. And so, I see. so I, uh, on X509 distinguished, or X500 distinguished name that we have a complicated two string that takes flags. One of the flags is called reversed, which is printed the normal way. Two string uses the reversed flag. And so this is sticking with the reversed is probably what you want, but we're going to give you the option. Okay, those are all the pieces. I don't like this one, but I couldn't come up with a better name. Good single value as string. Seems good to me. Because if you ever need a float, you can still do the float or whatever. I, I'm not sure what data type you saw that wasn't the string, but you could still expose it as a, if you, if you, if you add string to the name, it's easy to expose it, whatever other type there is. Yeah. the. <clears throat> One of the ones that I found the data type was itself an OID, which technically could be stringified, but the string would not be, it's not actually encoded as a string. So um, I, I didn't want to wire that up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, other than that, it seems to make sense to me, but I'm also not sure I understand everything you just explained so <laughs> uh, um, right so I have a sample here of 
if you wanted to read just the CN value, which is what people think of as the simple subject out of a certificate, uh, it would. Ah, uh, yeah. So the the one question I had is like, so you basically say you only want to support single, but then what prevents us from exposing multiple is just we don't want to write the code for it, or is it just? So the thing we would have to do with multiple is it would be an I enumerable of tuples of effectively of the OID and the payload. So the payload either being the the as string or the the raw data. Um, because that's what it is in the file. It's you have a collection of pairs of an identifier to say what kind of what the purpose of the value is, and then the value. And then what you really have is a collection of collections of these pairs. And many things go wrong if the inner collection has more than one item. I see. And everything goes wrong if it has zero. The spec says it's not legal. But, um, yeah, I was naively thinking you have some other type that just has basically the OID and the get single value a string or whatever, and then you just have a an unenumerable of this thing here, and then when people basically write the code that says you know zero I fail, more than one I fail, and otherwise I just call single and then I get my thing right. Yeah, uh, you know for. If you wrote your code like this, where if there was ever a multiple value you want to fail, um, on any certificate issued by a publicly trusted certificate authority, this is forbidden. So this would only be on weird enterprise PKI or people inventing their own stuff. At least I'm pretty sure it's forbidden because it doesn't work. Um, so Forbidden the, by not working. <laughs> uh, it, it breaks things. Again, like it's, you'll get different answers of, you know, you, if you're asking if the CN is found, you might get a different answer on different OSs because some of them only look at ones that have singles. Some of them will walk in a different order. Uh, for if you had a multiple value and you're in reverse, did they walk? Did they only reverse the collections or did they reverse the entire walk? So it, what the notion of first is becomes different. And uh, on .NET Core 1, we couldn't correctly two-string a X500 uh, distinguished name on Linux that had a multi-value already in because OpenSSL's two-string just says no. Uh, it's just like, we're done. We don't care. We don't support this. So we had to implement the two-string ourselves. Yeah, that's... Uh... But yeah, OpenSSL not supporting it in their two string, I think, should give an idea of how not common it is. So I didn't feel it was worth the API. Fair enough. We could add it later if someone wanted it. Yeah, it might be ugly though, but yeah, I guess. Fine. Yeah. If it's super rare, then it's not worth. Right. Like it's basically on X five hundred relative distinguished name, we would add a, you know, values, enumerable, and we'd name it we'd have to name it something it's not named in the spec it just says it's a set of the structure OID and value so we'd have well, to clearly it will be x500 relative distinguished name value right uh, yeah apparently which would make sense but in the common case that felt like an unnecessary indirection and the yeah. common case is extremely common but I didn't yeah. want the type to I didn't want this to be a surprise throw, which is why I added the has multiple values. So you can precondition the throw. Yeah, it's a bit weird that we fall from the property, but yeah. I guess I made this one be null. So we could also get rid of has mul multiple values. It's it's just a projection of the nullarity of this value. But. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, you could also just have a method, right? Get single value as OID, right? And then they both throw if uh, as multiple values is true. Could. I wouldn't. It. I think it would just be get single value type because 
Yeah, fair enough, yeah. To make it's sure not, that it, it wasn't familiar. saying that you were interpreting the value segment as... Um, yeah. You could also avoid the value duplication by just calling it element, right? Single element type, single element value that might be a bit more readable. But yeah. I'm good with it's element. Only the... <clears throat> we could revive the good old uh, XML schema name particle. That's always fun. More APIs should have particles. But I've never actually heard an explanation for why it's called particle. Why is it called particle? So the, in XML schema, the way this works is you have these shapes, basically, right? Where you basically say this is a sequence, or this is a choice, or this is a um, an right. alternation, or whatever. And they just called this abstraction particle for some reason. I guess it's basically because it's a it's a fragment in the molecule or whatever. I don't know. Like it's a we are so I'm like, creative, us computer people. To be fair, I'm not sure that's us. I think that's actually the XML schema spec, I think. No, I meant computer people in general in the world. Yeah, that, yeah <laughs> that is very true. I think it was somebody who really wanted to be an astrophysicist and couldn't pass the exam or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So is this the shape you were thinking, Emo? Uh, has multiple. Maybe you want to call it has multiple elements then to make that kind of. Yep, that works for me. Nodes as pretty as crypto will ever be. Where does this X500 come from? Is that the name of the spec or? Yeah. So yeah. like the X509 and X509 certificate is uh, the name of the spec that uh, that created them is X.509, where X is, I think X means Active Directory. Um, oh, it'd help us. Yeah. Certificates came out of Active Directory. Well, Microsoft invented that stuff? No. ITUTX. What is this? What is the Series X? Data networks. Open systems communication and security. Mm. Yes. And then X500, the 500 series is the directory. <laughs> And 509 is certificates. Oh, so it's basically LDAP, right? Because I think LDAP is the is the yeah. idea, and then Active Directory is the Microsoft like, yeah. product for that. Yeah. Yeah. Public Beautiful. key and attribute certificate frameworks is part of the directory. And yeah, so all so the X500 distinguished name is the same thing that elements in LDAP are named. Yep, that goes back to what Steven said. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's it for today. I think the other two probably need an hour, probably, and couldn't, depending on, because they look very sizable. Maybe not an hour, but probably 20 minutes each. Yeah, something like that. This one just, <laughs> like, the authority key identifier just, it has simple concepts, but this is basically overload explosion. Um, right. I guess we do the rest Tuesday. Sounds good. You want to approve the distinguished name? I thought I did. It was just the name? Yeah. I hit it here. There it goes. I even hit refresh to make it do it. But... Okay. Alrighty. And we haven't had any uh, comments from chat since Klaus was talking. And so I will see all of you, I guess, except those of you who happen to be on vacation next week, uh, at our same .NET time on our same 
Dotnet channel. Awesome. Have a good one. Auf Wiedersehen. Thanks again. Bye. Tschüss. Tschüss. Ciao, ciao.